If you have a Bible, John chapter 5. I will be bringing the lessons out of the gospel of John. He is striving to prove to individuals that Jesus is the Son of God. As he said in John 1, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, the same was in the beginning with God, and without him was not anything made that has been made. And so he lets us know that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. John 1, 14, that Word became flesh and lived among us. And John says, he beheld his glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth, out of all that mankind could dream, that was out of mankind's dream box, that God would come to earth, that Jesus would come down here and live in sinful flesh as we know it, but he came down and lived a perfect life in the flesh because we needed a perfect sacrifice to be offered for the sins of the world, John 3, 16, 17. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved by him. What a savior. I guess one of the things that concerns me coming back to America is that Walmart can move into town and build a big old super Walmart. And their parking lot stay full. And ours is only full on Sunday morning. Hello? Sunday nights you can't find half the members with a search warrant. <clears throat> Amen. Amen. Yes. Just pray that Jesus don't come on Sunday night <laughs> or Wednesday night. You see, what Jesus is after is a lifestyle that we live this because we're not going to all be in a fellowship whenever that time comes that he shows up or we leave this life. The key is it's about a consistent lifestyle. But Walmart moves in and they build a Walmart and everybody shops at Walmart, even people that don't know English. <clears throat> Amen. Amen. All right, I see y'all kind of doing this. I'm thinking a few people got Alzheimer's or something. <laughs> Just, just say amen. We're okay. Everybody shops at Walmart. You know why? Is that where you got that gum from? That's why you're chewing it like that? <laughs> because the price is right. You can't beat Walmart price because they buy in bulk. And they, they outdo us. I mean, they are packed. Don't you go there on the holidays. <laughs> you go there, you're going to be there a while. And that's what they want. That's why I go ahead and practice my song leading at Walmart. Because I know they want me there and they think the longer I stay in there, the more I'm going to buy. It's just the opposite. That's the more I sing. <laughs> but you know, Walmart don't sell grace. What concerns me is when I see all these people that were flocking to Jesus, why aren't they flocking to us? It's the question I ask myself. Why aren't those people flocking to us the way they flock to Jesus? Has the word gotten out that we care? Has the word gotten out that we're striving to follow exactly what the Lord has given us in his word? 1 Corinthians 4, 6, that we're not going beyond the things that are written so that nobody become puffed up against the other? Somehow the word's not gotten out, so we don't attract those people that are seeking the Lord. I was playing basketball one day at University of North Texas, and of course, most of the guys can see that once upon a time I was an athlete, amen. <laughs> and they don't look at my body, they look at my face, they can tell I've been hit a few times, amen. <laughs> one of the guys walked up to me, he said, sir, he said, I've been out here watching you play basketball for about six months. He said, Jesus has sent me to you, and you're supposed to teach me Jesus. <laughs> How often does that happen? <laughs> well, I knew he'd been watching to see if I used any bad language, to see if hitting my finger with a hammer or kicking my little toe on the bed make me lose my belief. Hello? <laughs> and yes, I've hit my finger, and yes, I've hit my toes. And I don't do no swearing, but I do sit down and pray. <laughs> Don't ever think people aren't watching. We are God's camera. They say that when you come out of your household today that 
90% of what you do is on camera because cameras are everywhere. Well, all of what we do is on camera. That is the eyes of those around us are watching because there are those that are seeking. As Jesus said in Matthew 7, seek and you shall find. And so I'm hoping to challenge you tonight out of, we've gone through a little bit of John 1 and a little bit of John 3 and John 4. And tonight we're going to touch on John 5. I'm, I'm getting to some of these one-on-one interviews of Jesus. Because so many people think that he's not personable. God is not personable. He doesn't want a one-on-one relationship with you. Yes, he does. That's why Jesus taught us when we pray, our Father, that I can address him as my Father, my God. He wants that personal relationship. And that's one of the reasons I've been coming uh, this week out of John. Is so we can get back to being personable with our Father, with our Savior. And with one another. A handshake ain't going to get it for me, man. Amen. You can get about a handshake, man. Uh, I want your cheeks. Amen. (laughs) I want the world to see that we're family. Because when families say hello and goodbye, they don't do it with a handshake. It's usually with a wrap up. And so whoever takes me to the airport... They're getting a big wrap up and they're getting a big <laughs> drippy one. <laughs> you said you take me to the airport? <laughs> and after that person leaves, all these folks walk up and they say, Are you related to them? I was in Nashville and I picked up this guy to take me there and I just kissed him all over. And of course, he was white, one of my white brothers. And this grandma walked over that was white, and she's like, are, are y'all family? I said, yes, ma'am, we're blood. <laughs> <laughs> People, folks all around are looking. I'm always looking for opportunities. If I see a big, ugly guy, I just, I'm going to get me a hug and a kiss. Did we get that at breakfast this morning? I just saw a big, ugly guy say, hey, come here, nephew. You look like you're related to me because you're big and ugly. Give me a hug. I need a hug. What do you do? What do you do? The guy I called over. Oh, he hugged me back. He hugged me back. Oh, thank you. <laughs> he was bigger than me, wasn't he? Yeah. And he just gave me a hug and a kiss. I'm going to share some of God's love wherever I am with somebody. Amen. And I know if I get the big ugly ones, the rest of them, they know they can't fight it. <laughs> they just have to kind of give in. Well, let me sing a little bit and warm my chocolate up. A couple of songs that warm me up, Grandpa. (laughs) 387. 387. Then we'll get in John 5 after we sing for about 45 minutes. (laughs) There was one. Now, I know these young folks have school. I won't keep you past midnight. 387, does that one restore my soul? Yes, sir. I figure it's y'all's book. I just call out a number. You should know it. Amen. <laughs> you know this one? Because you look like you make a good song leader. Man, ugly people make good song leaders. <laughs> <laughs> so you spend a little time with me. I'm telling you what, I know you are talented. I just know you are. How old are you? 16. 16. Uh, when was your birthday? August 11th. All right. I'll give you that chocolate cake, I mean kiss, <laughs> to celebrate that. Good job. Congratulations. Restore my spirit, Lord, I need restore. My heart is weary, please help me, dear Lord. I stand in need of more strength from your word. Renew my, rebuild my, oh, restore my soul. Well, revive, but I, oh Lord, wait, I'm deep in my soul. Won't you please stir my desire to work in your full light in my heart, dear Lord? Your zeal from cold, renew my, rebuild my, oh, restore my soul. Well, re- my courage, Lord, it needs. Restore, don't you know that my cup 
is empty, won't you fill it? Dear Lord, replace all doubts and fears with faith. So boring, new my, rebuild my, oh, restore my soul. Well, restore my spirit, Lord. Yes, I need restored. Don't you know that my heart is weary? Please help me, dear Lord. Re in need of more strength from your word. Renew my, rebuild my, oh, restore my soul. Renew my love, rebuild my faith, oh, restore my soul. Renew my love, rebuild my faith, oh, restore my soul. And the church said, Amen. Amen. I think we can get some stuff restored. Y'all get me kind of pumped up. Can I stay here another week? I think I can get Omaha evangelized. Y'all sing like this all of a sudden? That's good singing. Oh, amen. Did you say amen? Amen. amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise God, Jehovah. Amen. Amen. See the baby Jesus. A lion in a manger. Well, it was early one morning. Hey, amen. Hey, hey, hey. Born down in Bethlehem. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. He's the great I am. See him at the seaside, or talking to the fisherman. Well, he was making them disciples. Hey, amen. Hey, hey, hey. Walking on the water, showing us heaven's borders, doing like he ought to. Was turning over tables, showing us God is able to keep us all stable. Amen. Amen. He was healing all the people, making us all equal. There's gonna be a sequel. Amen, 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 amen. Sin in the garden, praying to his father in deepest sorrow. Amen, amen. Sin before Pilate. Standing on trial, I'm making a good confession day. Amen. Amen. I see him on the cross. He died to save the lost. He paid a great, great cost. Amen. Amen. I see him in the grave. He died for us to save. And he rose to live again, church. Amen. Hey, hey, hey. Smile while you sing it. Hey. Hallelujah. Praise God, Jehovah Church. Amen. 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 The church said, 
Now, if you want to stay around and do a little bit more of that, I got another 30 verses. <laughs> when I first heard it, there was just three. <laughs> I like telling that story of Jesus. It brings me back to the gospel. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. I'm moved by Jesus, and I guess one of the things that I have been doing for the past 20 years or more, I've started studying Jesus' life more closely. I am just blown away and truly moved by his handling of people. Uh, nothing caught him by surprise. Nothing caught him off guard. Yes, he was God. Still is. Was in the flesh. Still is at the right hand of God. But I'm moved by his ability to handle people. I believe that's one of the reasons uh, John 1.14, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. God could have brought about salvation as he had in the Old Testament without sending a son down here. And having him go through that. He didn't just come to die for the sins of the world and to be the Lamb of God, John 1.29 and John 1.35. But he came to teach us how to deal with one another. And just each of these encounters, I'm, I'm constantly moved how Jesus was able to find that one in a crowd. And that's something that I've been doing now for some 30 years whenever I'm out in public, I'm always working the crowd looking for that one. We sing the song, lead me to some soul today. I like to say, lead me to one soul today. And so I'm always looking for my one. In fact, uh, some of the young men I trained in Oklahoma, we had some t-shirts printed up and it was called Just One. And it created a lot of conversation because people's like, Just One, what's Just One? I said, might be you. You may be my Just One, Lord. Jesus was able to find that one. Here in John chapter 5, as we are about to read, he could walk even among the lame, the blind, the sick, and find that one that was ripe, that was ready to be picked, that was ready to serve God, that was ready to be filled with God. And he would use that individual to teach others, as I believe he is doing still in this chapter. John 5, beginning of verse 1. After these things, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up into Jerusalem. And there in Jerusalem, by the sheep's gate, I want you to remember that location, a pool, which is called in the Hebrew Bethesda, having five porches. Verse 3. And these lay a multitude of them that was blind, halt, and withered. Verse 5, and a certain man was there, doesn't give us his name. Many believe they don't give the name because when John wrote, he was still alive. Didn't want him to suffer any persecution. But a certain man was there who had been 38 years in that marriage. I mean sickness. <laughs> Amen, church. <laughs> and point being is, don't bellyache to this guy. He's been there a while. Your marriage, your parents, your job, your boss. This writer gives us the length of years. May have some, some significance to the Jews being 40 years out in the wilderness. May have some significance to the Pharisees. They had 39 laws they had written that you couldn't violate on the Sabbath. But it tells us 38 years in his infirmity. Six, when Jesus saw him lying and knew that he had been a long time in that case or state, he said to the man, and this is your question tonight, do you want to be made whole? That is the question you must answer tonight because Jesus has put a question to you and I this day. Do we want to be made well? Do we want to be made whole? What's keeping you from being the follower God wants you to be? From leading others to Jesus? From having the marriage? From being an elder? From being an evangelist? From being the light of the world? 
What's keeping you? What's holding you back? As I like to title this, it's your move. It's what Jesus is telling the gentleman. Do you want to be made whole? Notice verse 7. The sick man answered and said to him, Sir, I have no man when the water is troubled to put me in the pool. But while I'm coming, someone else steps in front of me and cuts me off. Sounds like the freeways today. Is that what Jesus asked him? If somebody was cutting him off? He never heard Jesus because he was so full of complaining. All he could do is keep on complaining and belly aching. He didn't answer the question. And Jesus said to him, verse 8, Arise and take up your bed and walk. And straight away the man was made whole, and he took up his bed and walked. Now it was the Sabbath day, so the Jews said to him that was cured, It is the Sabbath. It is not lawful for you to take up this bed. But he said, The one that made me well, he's the one that told me to take up my bed and walk. Just pass the buck. I mean, you mean people could not rejoice? A man had been paralyzed 38 years and nobody said, praise God. All they could say was, it's the Sabbath. Wow. Wow. Tells you about the leadership of that day. Couldn't even praise God. Not a one of these guys could do a miracle. But here they all wanted to attack Jesus because of doing God's work. On the Sabbath. Jesus had already told them. When you have a donkey fall in a ditch, what do you do? He already knew. He was a creation of God. And these men, these leaders, valued animals above God's creation. They pull a donkey out of a ditch. But they don't get upset that somebody is made well on this day. And not even praise God. What a story. Over by the sheep's gate. Y'all remember that? Y'all know what's over there, that sheep gate? Bad. Man, can you imagine? Woo. <laughs> As though they put all them sheep, they were getting ready to slaughter on the altar. You see, they too had taken all of their deformed, handicapped, blind, lame, sick, withered, and shoved them off into a corner. Over by the sheep's gate. In other words, normal society didn't walk that way. You know how you feel when you see them people at the stoplight. And they got the sign that says, we'll work for food. And of course, Burger King's got a piece of paper in the window that says, not hiring. All they got to do is bathe, clean up, they can get a job. That may not be true with everybody. I can't pick through them, but that's what goes through my mind. And of course, they give you that look, don't they? And I'm saying, Lord, keep that light green. Keep that light green. Because they just milk your emotions. Because I can't pick the bad ones from the good ones. And so my insides wrestle just like anybody else's. When my kids are in the car, they're like, Daddy, can we do something? We'll get them a Happy Meal. I give them some food. I don't always know what to do. Sometimes I do and sometimes I don't. This day Jesus did. Notice he didn't heal all of them. You see, Jesus didn't come to be a faith healer. He came to save the soul. That's one of the reasons this was put in here. It's your move. Do you want to be made whole? He said, then take up your bed and walk. The man had a choice in the matter. And from what the scripture says as you read on, when the Jews got after him, he pushed the blame on this man that healed him. They said, who is it? He said, I don't know. Later on, Jesus found him in the temple. And apparently to be welcomed back into society, he had to go offer what Moses told to offer to the priest. 
and Jesus found them in the temple courtyards. I didn't know for years when the Bible said, and they were in the temple, only priests went in the temple. What it means is they were in the temple courtyard. You had to be a priest to go in the temple. Even Jesus couldn't go in the temple because he was not from the tribe of Levi. He found them and he said to the man, I'd like to read this. It registers. Uh, let's begin about verse 13. But he that was healed knew not that it was Jesus because he had hidden himself away in the multitude being in that place. After Jesus found him 14 in the temple and said to him, Behold, you have been made whole. Sin no more. Implying that it was his sin that had put him in this condition. Lest the worst thing befall you. The man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had made him whole. And for this cause the Jews persecuted Jesus because he did these things on the Sabbath. But Jesus answered and said, My father works until now, and I work. For this cause, therefore, the Jews sought the more to kill him. Because he not only broke the Sabbath, but he also called God his own father, making himself equal to God. That got some people riled up and upset. Notice what the gentleman said now. When the Lord said, you want to be made whole? He said, well, every time I want to get in this water. Now, some of y'all's translations will say, because at certain times of the year, an angel came down and troubled the water. And whoever stepped in the water first was made well. Can you imagine the traffic? Can you imagine the stampede when that water started bubbling? I mean, I like all of y'all, but I would step on you if there was some deformity I had. And I got to get, I'm getting to that water. But this guy didn't have the power to put himself in the water. Now you're hearing pain talking. Every time I want to get in the water, somebody cuts me off. His point was nobody helps me. Everybody's so concerned about their son, their daughter, their dad, their mom. Nobody stopped to help this guy. And after the water starts bubbling, the stampede take off, one person is still there. And many believe this particular miracle was done in somewhat private because everybody else was focused on the bubbling of the water when the angel had come down. This guy stuck out here, can't move. He doesn't have the power to put himself in the water. You and I don't have the power to heal ourselves. As Jesus said, this Proverbs, you'll say to me, heal thyself, physician. I need you to let God heal me because God will do it through you. He's not going to use me to heal me. Isn't that amazing? That it takes other people to help me grow, learn, be passive. We help one another. We have a God that is a God of the people. You ever hear that saying about coaches? He's a player's coach. But well, Jesus sure is. Because he wants a personal relationship. Young girl ran home from school one day and she's like crying, upset. Run upstairs and slam the door. Her dad said, honey, honey, what's the matter? She said, people, 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 daddy, I can't stand people. He said, well, let daddy come in and talk to you. She said, no, sir. He said, why not? She said, you're people. <laughs> Who's going to get on your nerves? Who's going to get you all raised up out there on that freeway or highway or on your job or in a church building or in Walmart? Who's going to get on your nerves? people. Isn't that amazing? The word became flesh. He came down here to show us how to deal with his people, with one another. And he calls us from all walks of life, so you know there's going to be some adjusting. Now you know that I know, and I got to know that you know that I know that you know, that you men don't like me kissing you. Amen? Tough. Suck it up. <laughs> Amen. It ain't about me and it ain't about you. Amen. Come on, give me some love. Thank you. Thanks for coming out tonight. Thank you. Yes, sir. I hadn't got you yet. That's my first one. 
That's the hello. You get a goodbye one. <laughs> People. How long have I known you? 30 minutes? Oh, well, let me come. I didn't stay on your cheek long enough. <laughs> See what I'm getting at? It doesn't take me having to know somebody. He's made in God's image. God's love is supposed to be unconditional. I don't have to know somebody. They don't have to look like me. You might in a few years, as you can see with my little brother. <laughs> what a joy it is to see how Jesus just deals with people. He finds somebody that's been bleeding out. He has been at this spot for 38 years. Can you imagine the amount of years the stampede blew by him? And he's got some people problems after 38 years. Somebody cuts me off. Everybody runs by me and just passes me up. Nobody helps me. Now you're talking about somebody that could bellyache. 38 years in that marriage. I mean, infirmity. <laughs> and Jesus picks him because he can't put himself in the water. He picks him to teach us a lesson. I can't heal myself. I can't grow to be like Jesus by myself. It takes other brothers and sisters forgiving me, Showing patience with me, being a good listener, granting me some wisdom from their study and knowledge, hospitality, and sometimes just a hug. Sometimes it's just a hug. Because we are people that can't live without touch. Look how many lepers Jesus touched. He didn't have to touch them, but we can't live without touch. He created us to have touch. You know why I hug men and kiss men? Because my father never did that with me. I don't ever want another young man to have to go through 40 years of life before he has a hug and I love you from another man. I went to do a meeting in a little town called Lynchburg, Tennessee. I didn't want to learn how they got that name till I got out of town. Amen. <laughs> but I did find out they had a Jack Daniels plant there, so I knew I couldn't stay long. <laughs> and I went up to the high school, and they might have had 100 people in the senior class or something like that. But I spoke to the auditorium, to, to the student body, and they had three guys there, and they looked like, the three stooges, one of them was about 270, one was about 260, one was about 250, and they were the biggest guys in school. I said, three stooges, come on down here. Like, Who are you talking to? Come on, three stooges. So the first one came down, and I picked him up, and, and he just, he just melted like hot butter. I went to go to the second one, and he looked like a Heisman trying to stiff arm me. I just grabbed the arm and reeled him in. And I turned to go after 270 pounds, and before I could get to him, he jumped up in my arms, wrapped his legs around me, and I had to get my lips out of the way. He was <laughs> kissing me everywhere. Wait, not on the mouth, not on the mouth. I'm trying to shock him. He's got me shocked now. Woo, no. <laughs> I said, I want to meet your daddy. He said, sir, he is standing right over there. And I kiss him every morning and every night. I went over and grabbed his daddy and kissed him. And I said, thank you, dad. I said, you're raising this one right. You see, when I put a young man in my arms, what I'm gauging is what his relationship is like with his daddy. Your body language will give it away. You can't hide it in a hug. I can tell if you're experienced. I can tell if you're unexperienced. I can tell you if you're uncomfortable. You see, we have those sensors in our skin. And body language is thrown off. And I'm finding out how bad the bleeding is. Had a 12-year-old boy come up to me after a lesson in Alabama. 
1976. He made me cry. At that time, I was still lacking in my confidence. He said, Brother Willie, he said, I wish you were my daddy, and I lost it. My dad died an alcoholic and a drug addict, 85 years old. My greatest fear at that time was growing up and being like him. That's not something I wanted. I didn't marry because I didn't think anybody would want to marry me. When that little 12-year-old said that, it just broke me. This little kid at 12 years old, he wished I was his daddy? That just rocked me. I didn't think any kid would want me as a father. And I had to dig a little bit deeper into Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. For by grace have you been saved through faith and not of yourself. It is the gift of God. And not by works so that no man should boast. The it there is talking about salvation. Verse 10 says, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works which God afford prepared that we should live in them. I determined after I left that meeting that I would raise my bar. I would raise the bar, my morals, my commitment to Christ to such a height that if I were ever to be that young boy's father, that he would not be ashamed of me. I'd never seen him again, but he didn't realize how his sermon moved me. I wish you were my daddy. I've never forgotten it. That little 12-year-old rocked my world. He saw something I didn't even see. But that night, he left me with this same thought. It's my move. If he saw something that would make him say that, I need to raise the bar. That's what Jesus is telling this gentleman here. Do you want to be made whole? Jesus knew what day it was. He could have came a day early. He could have came a day later. But he's doing that for a reason. Half the nation of the Jews, if not all of them, were sick. And they didn't even realize it. Dying spiritually, as so many are today. Someone said if you could check your spiritual pulse, you'd be surprised how nearly dead you are. If you and God have moved apart, you can be sure as to which one of you have moved. Because my God's the same yesterday, today, forevermore. Hebrews 13. I figured it was my move. As I'm reading my Bible and learning scripture and I'm reading about what Christ did and people in the first century selling all their goods and laying them at the apostles' feet, Acts 5. One of the guys with the Los Angeles Rams, he hit me white square in the eyes. He said, well, I'm not trying to say you're not a Christian. He said, but I don't see you giving up nothing for your faith. Are you kidding me? A football player asking a question like that? He said, in other words, I don't see you make no sacrifices for your God. He said, I don't know you're not sleeping around. I don't know if you're not doing drugs. I don't know if you're doing all the same stuff we're all doing. I don't see you making no sacrifices. Wow. I was not expecting that from a pro football player. <laughs> but it's amazing how that old devil works. And it's more amazing to know how God works. I knew then I was done. It was time for me to start fishing in a different pond. It was my move. I had all kind of Christians trying to talk about, no, you can still be a Christian and play pro football. How many of you know? I was, I, I'd reached that point where I knew it was time for me to make a move. It's your move. You ever hit that wall where you're not growing? You can read the Bible all day. You can fellowship with all kinds of, you're not growing. It's time to give something up. It was time for me to let it go. And of course, my mother, she was still on the welfare with six siblings at home. But all they were doing with the money was just being more worldly. She was drinking more and they were partying more. Six of those eight sisters came up pregnant at 16. Well, money sure wasn't helping them. They needed Jesus. And so when I told them I was quitting pro football, they thought I was in a cult and they made all kinds of accusations and cut me loose for about 10 years. But those are things that have to happen.
because you know what people say, ah, it's just a fad. He's going through a phase in life. Hey, give him a couple of years, he'll grow out of it. Hello. Well, let me see, 42 years it's been. Am I growing out of it? Can't you tell? Can you see how much I've missed football? <laughs> Gump said, life is like a box of chocolate. I like to say I'm like a box of chocolate because <laughs> you never know what you're going to get. Church, we don't have the power. We can have all white churches and you're not going to evangelize the world. You can have all black churches, you're not going to evangelize the world. You can have all Hispanic churches, you're not going to evangelize the world. We're not going to evangelize the world until we start putting emphasis on the gospel of Christ and not on the race of people. We can't keep catering to every race that comes into this culture. Is E.T. going to come down out of space and we build a church for E.T.? Church is about us moving closer to God. The man had to trust what Jesus said. In the beginning was the word. Jesus gave him the word. He healed the man with his words. Take up your bed and walk. Don't these words still have power? John 6 verse 63 says, It is the spirit that gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words I have spoken unto you, they are spirit in their life. When I live them, they give me life. I live. Because Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, 31, I die daily. I'm supposed to be dying to myself because I'm giving myself more to God. And I live. I breathe. That's the only reason I'm effective in teaching God's word. is because I've got to surrender daily. And I've got to take up my struggles, problems, whatever they be. Luke 9, 23. If any man will follow after me, a woman, let them deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow after me daily. Luke knew he was writing Gentiles. We have to be taught daily, not Sunday to Wednesday. Amen? Amen. We don't have the power. This man didn't have the power. He wasn't in a position either. He was not in a position to do anything about his condition. He knew he needed people. Hello. I need you. I need you, church. I need you, brothers and sisters. I need you, neighbor and friend. I need you. What grade you in? Junior. I don't know why when I go to high school, everybody's like, man, you old dude, what you doing up here? I can't go to the schools no more. What you doing up here? <laughs> Like old people can't come up to a school. Nobody would say that to you. You, you got that age. Y'all are at that age. 16, 17. You guys can go anywhere and be popular. I can't even walk around my own house. My wife and kids like, what you looking for? I said, I live here. <laughs> can I look around my house? <laughs> Man. <laughs> now I'm getting why I don't even talk. Because at 67, they're starting to say it. Dad, you losing it yet? <laughs> I got to watch these kids, man. They can't wait to stick me away somewhere. <laughs> I'm trying to be nice to them so they don't stick me in a nursing home with some nurse to try to smother me. <laughs> Brother Gary keeps saying I talk up a storm. <laughs> I'm not in a position. So we don't need titles. We as humans aren't in any, in any position to heal ourselves. I need you. We need each other. The young man that told me the gospel in 1973, April 26, I know for some of y'all it's kind of strange that I didn't learn to read until I was 25 years old and he had me buy the whole Bible on cassette and listen to 20 chapters a day and that's how I learned to read. Well, Sunday afternoon was nursing home. Y'all know what I'm talking about? <laughs> go to the nursing home. We go to the nursing home, and he said, okay, I need you to get up and speak. Uh, what am I going to talk about? He said, I'll tell you what to talk about. I would stand up. He'd get a chair and sit directly behind me. And he'd say, welcome to people. Glad that y'all are here today. Appreciate y'all all coming out. 
He said, uh, tell him we're going to start with Acts 2.38 through 47. We'll be starting with Acts 2.38 through 47. All right. And he started quoting. Repent and be baptized every one of you. In the name of Jesus, for the forgiveness of your sins, shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And I'd say right behind you. And so every Sunday for a year, we'd go out there. And I'd just peat and repeat. And that started bothering me. So finally I said, man, it's bothering me. He said, what's bothering you? I said, well, it's like Pete and repeat. You just tell me everything to say. He said, man, he said, anybody can get up and read off a piece of paper. He said, these people don't know if they're going or coming. He said, this is about you learning to get up before people and preach what you live. I said, yes, sir. We went back to next Sunday. What's that scripture? Uh, John chapter 3. John chapter 3 is what we're going to be today. <laughs> I didn't realize all that was training. I couldn't do that on my own. He was trying to help me get rid of stage fright. Learn the word of God. Preach what you live. If people don't see in your life what you're preaching, then they're going to think you're preaching a lie. If you preach what you're living, they can see it. He said it's all about us positioning ourselves in Jesus. And he takes us from there. The first Tulsa Soul Winning Workshop in 1975, they asked me to come there and speak, and I didn't know how many people was going to be there, and I'd never spoken in front of a big group of people, but I got there, and that was between 15 and 20,000. And in those days, I tried to type down everything I was going to say or write it down. And this was the first time in two years that I was a Christian that I was going to teach a lesson where Ron did not tell me everything to say. And I could see him walking back and forth in the crowd. He was nervous for me. And he had on a yellow suit. I'd never seen a white man in a yellow suit. <laughs> he looked like a daisy in the wind. <laughs> Just going back and forth. And I started speaking. I remember my intro was, I had to change uniforms for the same reason Superman needed a phone booth. I couldn't fly in the suit I was in. Is how I started out. I don't think I've spoken that sermon in about 30 years. And I started speaking, and he started crying. And the two years I'd known him, I'd never seen him cry. But Wilkinson tried to run him off the football team, put him at nose guard at 155 pounds against guys that was 260 pounds. And they just power drove him in the ground, split his tongue in two, swollen up his eyes, his mouth. There was only one bar across the helmets in those days. Uh, he's a pretty tough guy. When he started crying, I didn't realize what effect that would have on me. Here's somebody that's been training me in the word of God and setting an example before me. When he started crying, I started crying. I didn't anticipate that. And when I started crying, I couldn't read my notes. <laughs> That's why I had to learn to get rid of notes. <laughs> and I got through speaking. And he came up and he hugged me and he kissed me. And that was the first time in 25 years any man had put his arm around me and kissed me. I was uncomfortable with it. But it moved me because I know that he didn't do that to his own sons. Over the years, I surmised that it was him telling me the work that God had given him to do in my life was over. It was time for somebody else to take me under their wing and continue the training as Avon Malone did. I still remember that moment as if it was yesterday. And that's why I don't have a problem telling you I didn't learn to read until I was 25 years old. I, I ain't got no dog in no race. I have no reason to worry about being prideful. I'm a creation of God. Just by creation, <laughs> I'm an intelligent being. Amen, church? Amen. I don't need the world to try to tell me I have intellect. My God tells me that. He's the one who puts me in a position in the church where I can grow, in a family that's got to love me. 
in homes where I can see what a Christian home is supposed to be like. The many devotionals of men and women that let me sit in their home with their sons and daughters and sing these songs that we sing is where I've learned them. I'm a product, I like to say, of everybody that's loved me. All those 42 years of people opening their homes and singing songs and devotionals and saying prayers over meals and people hugging and telling me they love me. I told you the other night, I wondered why it was Paul who wrote 1 Corinthians 13. Why not John? I believe the church loved on Paul and they taught Paul to love again. Because any of us are human, he would have thought those Christians wanted to kill him the way the Jews did Jesus. But the church took him in and loved on him. I believe the church taught Paul to love again. And the reason I believe that is because it is the same church that taught me to love again. I left home with the promise of never coming back. As kids do, especially brought up like I was, had issues with my parents. The life they lived, the double standards they set, and the bad example they left before me. I've never touched alcohol. My mother being Cherokee, the old saying was Indians can't handle their liquor. Well, my mother could handle their liquor. She could outdrink anybody. But it destroyed somebody I loved, a father and a mother. We didn't use those words in my household. Love. Miss you. I hadn't hugged my mother since I was two years old. And this body took me in and began to teach me a godly love that wasn't based on conditions. It wasn't about boasting. It was not about rejoicing with evil, but rejoicing with the truth. And for the first time in some 25 years, when I signed with the Rams in 1974, I went home and I saw my mother after about four years. And I said, I love you. And we both began to cry. We hadn't said those words as adults. Because this family taught me to love again. Unconditionally. That's why I believe it's the church that taught Paul how to love again. Because the same church taught me how to love my mother and brothers and sisters and family again. Church, that's what we're all about. We're not supposed to be people with walls. Too many of us hunger for that love. Too many of us are wounded and bleeding and we need some healing that comes from this body. It's not one or two. The elders can't do all that. It's all of us. 1 Corinthians 12. If one part of the body hurts, it all hurts. If one part rejoices, we all rejoice. Not only do I not have the power, we're not in a position to hold something back. I'm not going to forgive you. Then you're not going to be forgiven. You can't hold forgiveness back from somebody. Somebody said, when you don't forgive, it's like drinking poison thinking it's going to kill the other person. Because all it does is hurt you. I believe Satan's trying to poison the church. You have people coming in this body and they still want to hold on to culture. They still want to hold on to that Americanism. Or they want to hold on to race. Or they want to hold on to position, CEO. One brother got upset at me because I wouldn't call him doctor. <laughs> My book says brothers, amen. amen. <laughs> You're all brother. Not so among you. The Gentiles love to have it lorded over them. Not so among you. Those that are greatest among you shall be your servants. That we serve one another. One of the hardest things to find in America anymore. Grandpa, you remember when you used to pull in a gas station? They checked the air in your tire, check your oil, wash your windows. <laughs> That's long gone. 
All they want is that dollar. You better get out and wash your own windows. Check your own oil. I mean, we can't even find service in this country no more. And America is one of the most blessed nations in the world, and you can't find service. What makes the people, people remember a restaurant? The food or the service? Always the service. And so when I go to restaurants, I'm going to always work the servants. I'm going to serve the servants. I'm going to find out their name, who they are, how many children in the family, the parents. I want to serve the servants because that's what Jesus did with me. The Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for all. Well, that's what we're doing when we serve. We're giving our life just like Jesus did. Because there is no higher position than being a servant that we serve one another from the heart. If you can't love your brother, 1 John 4, 8 through 16, if you can't love your brother who you have seen, how can you love God who you have not seen? It's easy to talk to talk, but what about walking the walk? We're supposed to be brothers and sisters who walk the walk and not just talk to talk. That's what the world is looking for. I know these athletes are looking for God. That's why they're always pointing to the sky. Hello? <laughs> don't tell me that I want more touchdowns, more yardage, bigger contract, more money. They want. I know they're looking for God. Do you know I get tired of being big and ugly? Amen, little guys? <laughs> I get tired of being big and ugly. Sometimes I want to be a little guy and just melt in, Brother Gary. You see, when you're always big guy and you walk in somewhere, everybody stare at you. <laughs> I get on an airplane, and when I get on an airplane, they close that door. You're mine. My stewardess can't control me. I'm not going to be aggressive in any way. But if you're staring at me, <laughs> you got that, didn't you? <laughs> what you going to do? I won't start blowing kisses. All them people staring at me. If I'm big and ugly and they stare, I won't blow kisses to the men. And they always do this. <laughs> and the wife does the same thing every time. Where? That big black guy blew me a kiss. My son likes to eat Subways before his football game. I went and got him a Subway and they made me stay in line. Like I told you, you make me stay in line, I'm going to punish you. So I started singing, and I looked over at the table, and there was four other people there. looked like a mom, a dad, and a son, and a daughter-in-law. And they're no more than two feet from me, so I just started staring at them. Daddy looked up, and I said, <laughs> <laughs> He covered up, and the wife said, Where? And she looked at me. So I got my sandwich. I walked over, and I said, uh, Sir, I caught you, didn't I? He said, excuse me? I said, you're a chocoholic. I caught you staring. Come in. <laughs> His wife said, <laughs> he kissed you. How long have you known him? He said, I ain't never seen him before. <laughs> she said, he kissed you. I said, that's because he's ugly. And when you're ugly, you can't complain about who sucks your face. <laughs> I said, move over. Mm. And I sat down, and we talked for an hour. We laughed. Our cheeks were hurting. Found out they weren't even from Texas. They were on their way back to Louisiana. They had a three-hour drive. What do you think they talked about for the next three hours? <laughs> we ain't never going back to that subway. <laughs> we don't know if any of us are going to be alive tomorrow. I'm not in a position to hold godliness back. Peter said in 2 Peter 1, 5 through 11, add to your faith virtue. That word virtue means moral excellence. Raise the bar. There's an urgency there, church. Raise those morals that will attract other people that's tired of sin. Your virtue knowledge, your knowledge self-control, your self-control patience, your patience godliness. 
a God consciousness. Your godliness, brotherly kindness, and your brotherly kindness, love. Of all people, Peter writes this. <laughs> when you talk about moving a position, not having the power, but not being in a position, here one keeps moving closer to godliness that brings about brotherly kindness and the brotherly kindness love. It's a process. I want to get to that love. I can't just jump over six of them. I've got to go through those stages of development so that people know that it's for real. They've seen a lot of the fake, amen. They, they watch the television. They watch the Billy Grahams and they watch the Oral Roberts and all these guys praying about blab it and grab it, name it and claim it. They're looking for what's real. I'm not in a position to be able to hold godliness back from people. I'd gone to work out my second year in the NFL. I'd gone to get a workout in and I didn't want to have knee problems. So I parked my car for six months and just rode my bike every day anywhere I went. I came home one evening and my car was totaled. Some young girls were doing drugs and they hit my car at 60 miles an hour, never any skid marks. They never hit the brakes. My car looked like a V. They had hit it and drove the bumper all the way up to the dash. I got there and the police were there and the girls were sitting on the curb just crying. We're so sorry. We don't have any insurance. Please don't put us in jail. I said, it's okay. Look, just sit down. I said, I got a question to ask y'all. Today could have been your judgment day. Do you know which way you would go? I mean, I, I, I got the floor. My car, they tore up. They got to listen. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> I said, the car can be taken care of. God's blessed me to take care of that car. What I'm concerned about is you two girls could have parted this life today. Do you know which direction you're going to go? And I sat and we talked about Bible for about two or three hours. Never seen him again. Church, there are opportunities we have every day to meet people and to share some of godliness with them. I keep a pocket full of change when I go to the store. When I see people reaching through their pockets and their wallets and their purses, I just throw a handful of change on the counter. I'm looking for those opportunities. I'm coming out of Walmart and there's a lady that's got one of these little plastic poos, she throws it on the back of the truck and she jumps in and gets ready to take off on the freeway. I can tell she didn't shop often because that thing's going to become a kite. I said, excuse me, ma'am. And I ran and jumped on the back of the truck. She had an old bike back there, threw it in the middle, had some straps, and I strapped it down. I said, have a good day. I went on home. Well, my oldest daughter at that time was nannying for a couple of lawyers in Denton. And that evening, they was going out to dinner, and she was going to watch their children. She came home that night, and she said, Daddy, one of the ladies that came over, she said that she was at Walmart. And this big old black guy jumped in the back of her truck and started tying down a swimming pool. She said, I knew then, Daddy, it was you. <laughs> she said, I didn't say a word. I just kept listening to see if they were going to say anything bad about you. <laughs> and she said, I never told them that that was my daddy. It probably startled her at first until I got out off the truck. But again, it's an opportunity to help somebody. Here she was telling a bunch of lawyers about some big ugly guy jumping on the truck and strapping down a pool. It started conversation. And that's what we got to look for. I don't have the power. I'm not in a position to hold back godliness. We're supposed to be God's vessels here to share godliness with as many as we can. Amen, church? Amen. That gospel that we're talking about, here we get to read about Jesus' encounter. I have a sneaky suspicion this gentleman's going to become a preacher. See, Jesus only healed one man. 38 years he was in that infirmity. I have a sneaky suspicion. I know where he was going to go back and be preaching at. How about you? Over by the sheep's gate. Where the maimed, the blind, 
the sick and withered. Can you imagine the belly aching? Well, you don't know what it's like. You haven't been out here. Uh, yes, sir. I was here for 38 years. Who can belly ache to this guy? 38 years. God's timing is impeccable. Because he was going to be helping heal the soul. He wasn't sent back to do miracles. He was sent back to preach truth so people could be saved. Church, that's why we're here. I'm not here to fit in. When we moved down to Tennessee, we had a little house there on about an acre. And I'm trying to stay in shape, so I'm using a push mower, cutting that acre. Well, some of the brethren there felt sorry for me. So they got a little motor and put it on a, a little old riding mower. And so I had me a horse. All of my neighbors, you could hear their cars start up in the morning, like clockwork. 7 o'clock, 7.15, 7.20, 7.25, I mean, at about 8 o'clock, the lawnmower started. And I started cutting grass. Everybody came home at 5 o'clock. Man, somebody cut my grass. They got you too? Man, they did. They got you? Yeah. Somebody. There's a lawnmower phantom around here. Somebody's cutting grass. It took about two years so they could figure out who was cutting all everybody's yard. One of my neighbors, she's about six foot tall like my wife. She was a speech pathologist like my wife. And she didn't have to be at work at 8 o'clock. I'd head for her yard and she'd go like the Supremes. Stop. In the name of love. She said, no, you can't cut my grass. Now, her husband was a full-time student at 30 years old. All he did was take classes. Never worked. <laughs> so she'd come over and started talking to my wife, and they'd sit out on the front porch in those Tennessee rocking chairs. And I'd be getting the meals fixed for the kids and feeding them and go over to the window, and I'm listening to their conversation. Hmm, yeah. <laughs> and she's like, I went to work today. I came home at lunchtime and my husband looked at me and said, what's for lunch? And he was home all day. And she said, I come over here and Willie's cooking and taking care of the kids and bathing the kids. And <clears throat> yeah, <laughs> I'm listening. <laughs> and finally, after about two years, they got pretty close. She said, I'll tell you why I won't let Willie cut my grass. She said, when y'all moved in the neighborhood, and we saw that Willie was black, my husband and I looked at each other and said, I wonder if they'll ever cut their grass. <laughs> gotcha! <laughs> That's the world. When people start confessing their sins to you, it's time now. You got them. They know you love them. They don't mind telling you whatever their struggles have been, because what made her think we was going to forgive her? She already knew. When people will start confessing their faults to you, they're convinced that you'll forgive them. Now, if people aren't willing to confess their faults to you, you got to lay some foundation. She had told my wife, she said, I can't have any children. She had had some cancer as a young girl. Doctor told her she couldn't have any babies. I said, well, the next time you're on the porch talking to her, tell her that we're praying she'll have eight. And I remember being at the window, and she's like, what? Eight? She said, yeah, my husband said, if you shoot for the moon, you'll catch stars. But if you shoot for stars, you'll just catch space. I don't know if I want eight. Eight, don't be choosy. <laughs> it wasn't six months later she come up pregnant. My, how God works. We had to babysit. <laughs> Can y'all watch little blonde haired blue eyed Paul? <laughs> oh, you should have seen the stairs I got at Walmart. <laughs> <laughs> Me and Paul shook up Murfreesboro. Church, there are people all around us who've been hurt who've been beat down just like this gentleman. And instead of Jesus coming to them today, he sends us. 
What are you going to tell these people who've let sin paralyze them? The sin of other people who've let sin cripple them. And they can't be the people they're supposed to be because they're carrying so much anger and animosity. That's why he's telling us these stories in the gospel. For the gospel to be effective in our own lives, we got to let it go. Isn't that what they said in Frozen? Let it go. Let it go. I mean, even the world knows you have to do that. Let it go. Don't be frozen. Because if you won't let it go, you're going to be frozen. What an encounter. Jesus said, you have been made whole. And stop living in sin unless the worst thing befalls you, happens to you. I don't want to go back to sin. I've already felt the wrath and the burn on my conscience of that. I can't come here and not get involved. They said, Willie, we want you to lead a song. Well, I didn't know nothing about singing. But if they told me to, they must know something I don't know. I'd gone to a Christian camp and I'd heard the song, My God and I go in the fields together. Oh man, I just love that song. Hearing 500 kids sing it. And so every time they asked me to get them lead a song, I don't care what the song was. It was always to the tune of, My God and I go in the fields together. I was wondering why everybody's doing this. <laughs> Where did he come from? Hey, if they told me to get up, I'm not going to tell God no. Over the years, these young people have taught me to sing a little bit, but I won't tell God no. And everybody saw I needed some teachers. And so I started recording the singing at the worship service on Sundays, Bible class on Wednesdays. And that's what I listened to all through the week. I knew all them radio songs, amen? I knew all them radio songs. Well, I don't want to need a, a, a song book when I come up here. I want to get these songs down in my head so I can sing with some spirit, so I can drown out the song leader, granddad. I want to drown you out. Because I want to sing praise to the one who saved me from being frozen and paralyzed. This was me, paralyzed over by the sheep's gate. Tonight, he's found you by the sheep's gate. And he's asked you a question. Do you want to be made whole? Do you want your marriage to exemplify that of Christ and his church? Do you want your influence to be as effective as Jesus' influence was? Then take up your struggles. Take up your job. Take up your children. Take up your wife. Take up your husband. And walk. Because now we walk with the Lord. I don't go through back doors no more because I walk with Jesus. Amen. <laughs> I say that to me. I'm not going to use worldly ways to try to get godly results. I want to use godly ways to achieve godly results. That's why I study Jesus closely. I move by the way he could talk to people knowing what to say when it needed to be said. Knowing how to speak so he could attract and draw people closer. And so one of my goals is to put a smile on 100 people's face every day. So anybody I encounter, I'm looking to put some joy in their life. I don't know what they go home to. I use this old phone. I try to call 50 to 100 people. And say a prayer with them. Use it for a good cause. If they don't pick up, that doesn't bother me. I leave it on the voicemail. I started out back in the 90s calling 20 college kids. I'd have a prayer with them. I said, now each one of y'all call five. And then tell each one of those five to call one. Can you imagine what it would be like for you to get a phone call during the day and somebody's just said, I just called to pray for you? You don't think that's going to fire you up? I'm praying for you and your wife, praying for you and your children, praying for you and your boss, praying for you and your town, your president, your governor. Wow. 
We say we believe in prayer. Let's practice it. Somebody said it's hard to stumble if you spend time on your knees. We have two positions of prayer, praying and sitting. I don't believe it's about the position of the body. I believe it's about the position of the spirit. But I do hit my knees. And sometimes I prostrate myself. I can't believe that God wants me in his kingdom. It just, it just lifts my spirit that somebody loves me more than I love my own self. Before my mother passed, she came to visit us in Tennessee. She said, boy, I talked to your wife. She didn't know my name was Willie until I went to college. I didn't know my name was Willie until I went to college either. She said, I talked to your wife, and she said, I asked her a question. Would you marry him twice? She said, what your wife told me, I've never heard a woman say. I don't know what my wife said, because my mother didn't tell me, and I will never ask my wife. That's between her and my mama. But whatever she said, it moved my mother. When I married, I married with the expectations of marrying someone that could be an example to my mother and my eight sisters by her actions, not by talking. I knew I wouldn't be able to reach my sisters and my brothers because all they could remember about me has just passed. Like I said, they knew me as a boy, not as a man. But people that know me know that I don't get so busy that I don't take time. Like I told you, when the kids knock on my door, I'm dropping what I do, and I'm going to spend some time. It's so easy for people to say, I have no time, no time, too much to do. That was my constant cry. No time to give to those in need. At last was time to die. And when before the Lord I came and I stood with downcast eyes, in his hand he held a book, it was the book of life. God looked into his book and said, your name I cannot find. I once was going to write it down, but never found the time. Don't get so busy that you pass up opportunities for God, for godliness. I don't believe America is going the way she's going because of the politicians. I believe America is going the way she's going because of the church. Paul could say in Colossians 1.23 that the gospel had been preached in all the world. Have we done that to our world, America? Carrying this gospel message to everyone we can, everywhere we go, looking for those opportunities wherever we are. You would not believe the places I find people. Three o'clock in the morning, I find a guy in the bathroom. In Yellowstone. I go in the men's room. And there's just two of us in there. White guy way down there. I go way to the other end. Don't want to scare him. I glance down and he glanced down. He's like, ah! Uncle Chocolate! Uncle Chocolate! Uncle Chocolate! He just starts screaming Uncle Chocolate. I knew I'd known him since he was a kid if he's calling me Uncle Chocolate. He grabbed me by the arm. I can't believe I can't believe it's you. Can't believe it's you. He drags me over to the girls' bathroom. Crystal! 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 He's just screaming Crystal. And this girl walks out. Tattooed up. I guess you young folks say tatted. <laughs> and she looks over and she's like, what? This is my Uncle Chocolate! She looks over at me and goes, so, <laughs> all attitude. How you doing? Hey, good to see you, little brother. Got you in my prayers. Hope y'all are okay. I go back to the car. My wife knows me well enough now. She said, who was it? I said, well, there's this guy kept calling me Uncle Chocolate, but I don't know.